after getting a picture into the future of a company, a value investor would go about estimating the intrinsic value of the company based on their newly acquired insight. This would allow them to know if the current stock price of the company is overpriced, underpriced, or at its fair value. The most commonly used method is known as a discounted cash flow analysis. This video is a first attempt at using the discounted cash flow analysis to estimate the intrinsic value of Citigroup. Essentially, a discounted cash flow analysis, known as a DCF, estimates how much cash is being generated by a business that is available to its owners. This is also known as the free cash flow. This requires a few variables to be inputted. The net income of the business, deducted by the amount of capital that is used to maintain the business or to expand its offerings. For most businesses, the cost of maintenance can be obtained by looking at the change in working capital and its capital expenditures. This reflects the amount of money that is regularly invested into the business to obtain short-term and long-term benefits. Examples include working capital that is used to buy raw materials to produce products or investing in machinery to manufacture new products. With financial institutions like Citigroup, using the DCF method is unreliable. This is because in banks, most of the raw material is cash itself and most of the investments it makes are in its workforce rather than in physical machinery. Not only is it impossible to acquire numbers for these metrics, but they will also be extremely subjective. From the previous video, I know that banks have to maintain a certain amount of equity on their books relative to the amount of risky assets that they have. These ratios, known as the common equity tier 1 ratio or the tier 1 capital ratio, are set by regulatory authorities. These minimum set help prevent banks from being undercapitalized when financial crises occur. If these ratios are not met by banks, they will be under stricter regulation which will impair their ability to generate greater returns for their shareholders through buybacks or dividends. Therefore, one can use these capital requirements imposed on banks as a proxy to what a bank needs to invest in itself to maintain its profitability. To start this calculation off, we need to get some baseline values. As of the second quarter of 2022, Citigroup has their risk adjusted assets sitting at 1.2 trillion and their tier one capital ratio at 11.88%. Solving this equation gives a tier one capital of 144 billion. As of the most recent Federal Reserve requirements, Citigroup's required common equity tier one capital ratio has been raised to 12% for March, 2023. Citigroup's management currently has an internal target of a common equity tier one ratio of 1% above whatever the regulatory requirement is as a safety buffer. This makes the internal CET1 ratio go to 13%. Based on historical values, the tier one capital ratio is usually 1.5% above the CET1 ratio. Therefore, I have estimated that the target tier one capital ratio for Citigroup to be 14.5% for the next financial year. As for the long-term tier one capital ratio target, I have set it to be 15%, which although is higher than it's ever been since the financial crisis, it doesn't seem to be unreasonable for Citigroup as it is one of the largest banks in the world and therefore will be under greater scrutiny. As for their risk-weighted assets, I have made the assumption that it will grow at the same rate as expected from the US economy, which is around 2.68%. This value is based off the latest US Treasury 10-year T-bond rate. These assumptions allow me to estimate the amount of tier one capital that they will need to have for the next 10 years in order to meet their regulatory requirements. And the increase in their tier one capital each year will represent the amount of capital that needs to be invested by the bank to maintain its operations. As for estimating future earnings, the current value of the common shareholders equity is at $200 billion, whilst the net income over the last 12 months has been 19 billion. This gives a return on equity of 9.72% over the last 12 months. For the next 10 years, I have made the assumption that Citigroup will improve their return on equity slightly to around 9.94%, which is a value that I'll explain how it got to later on. Because we have already estimated how much Citigroup will need to increase the equity by for the next 10 years, we can use those values combined with the presumed return on equity to estimate the net income for the next 10 years as well. And since we're treating the increase in book equity each year as the investments that Citigroup has to make to maintain its operations, we can also estimate the free cash flow by deducting the net income each year by the amount spent on increasing its book value. At the end of the 10th year, I will use a steady state method to estimate the value of the business as if it continues to operate perpetually. In this perpetual state, I have assumed that Citigroup will continue to grow at 1% below the expected rate of the economy forever. This value has to be set below the expected rate of growth of the economy as no company can grow faster than the economy forever or else it will end up being larger than the economy itself. After estimating all of these figures, I need to discount these numbers to see how much they're worth today. 
to quickly explain why, it is because $1 today is worth more than $1 next year. Not just because of inflation, but also because of the ability of that dollar to generate returns for me if I were to invest it into something. The rate at which I discount future cash flows with is known as the cost of equity. And how I arrived at this discount rate is slightly more complicated to be explained in this video, but to put it simply, I have used the average implied cost of equity for US banks as of now, which is 9.94%. The term implied means that this is the cost of equity that investors will be paying for if they were to buy the average US bank at its current price. If you remember, I have decided to use the same 9.94% for my return on equity at the end of the 10 years, and for the company to continue generating in perpetuity. When the return on equity is equal to its cost of equity, this implies that the bank would be able to generate just enough income to cover for its cost of equity and not generate any more excess returns. Using this cost of equity, I can now discount these future cash flows at Citigroup to obtain its present value, which after dividing it by the number of shares outstanding, gives me an estimated intrinsic value of $73.55 per share with the current price of the stock sitting at $51.66 per share. At first glance, it would appear that Citigroup shares are trading below their intrinsic value, which would indicate a buy for the stock. However, we must consider the assumptions I have made for the stock and whether or not those values reflect the story that you have for the bank's future. Personally, the riskiest assumption I've made, in my opinion, is assuming that Citigroup will be able to increase their tier one capital ratio to 15% while successfully increasing their return on equity over time which their track record over the last decade doesn't support, unless you believe in the promises and visions touted by the new CEO. This video serves to explore an alternative to performing a discounted cash flow analysis for a financial institution by using the tier one capital requirements as a proxy for investment and maintenance costs for its operations.